Hello and welcome to the Wire Talks. I am Siddharth Bhatia. History is always written by the victor, it is said, but aren't some facts of history uncontestable? Indian historical knowledge has been the product of painstaking research by experts over decades. Post-independence, Indian textbooks began reflecting history that gave the Indian and not the colonial point of view, and these have been taught to school children and to undergraduates for a very, very long time. The news, therefore, that the National Council for Educational and Research Training, or NSERT, which advises the government on school education, has made several important cuts to the high school textbooks in history, political science, and perhaps other disciplines, has sent shockwaves among academics and educationists. Vast portions about the Mughals have been taken out, as have references to the RSS being banned after Mahatma Gandhi's assassination. There will be no mention now anymore of Maulana Azad, not even a stray line, a key political intellectual. Leading historians have protested vocally and the Indian History Congress, which is over 90 years old, has called it alarming. Why do these changes matter? To understand this, we reached out to the well-known historian Professor Mridula Mukherjee. Professor Mukherjee has taught at the Center for Historical Studies, JNU, for over four decades. She has held many important posts such as the Director, Nehru Memorial Museum and Library, and Dean, School of Social Sciences, JNU, and has been a visiting professor in institutions in Italy, France, Brazil, the U.S., and Japan. She has written several books on India's independence and after, and she has co-authored an interesting book which completely is in line with what we are going to discuss today called RSS School Textbooks and the Murder of Mahatma Gandhi, the Hindu Communal Project. As is obvious, she is the right person to be discussing this issue with us today. Professor Mridula Mukherjee, welcome to the Wired Talks. Thank you. Ridula ji, why do you think NSERT has changed these history books now? Secondly, it is an autonomous body and has no obligation to go with the government line. So why do you think this has happened? Well, in theory, yes, to answer to the second part of your question. In theory, they are an independent body and they don't have to go with uh, what the government says. But as you know, what's happening in all our institutions, the one, the government takes great care to appoint people with whom they are comfortable politically and who will heed their, within quotes, advice. And this is one such case where clearly that's happening. The answer to the first part of your question is why now? Well, actually, it's not now. This has been in the process. They made some changes earlier in 2017. Then they've been making changes in syllabus at various levels, including at the undergraduate level. A Delhi University syllabus or the university syllabus UGC brought out a couple of years back. Lots of changes have been suggested in that. Then a parliamentary committee actually went into the whole thing and gave all kinds of recommendations based on a report by a think tank that is headed by a well-known political person. So, you know... At various levels, the preparations for this have been going on. And protests have also happened. But somehow, this time, it has caught the media attention. And the protests are happening at a much wider level. Earlier, bodies like the Indian History Congress, groups of people here and there, we had all gone on making our noises, but with little effect. We People even went and gave evidence before the parliamentary committee. But as you know, nothing really matters. Once this government and this political regime makes up its mind about something, they are very sure they know the truth. So they go ahead and you know give it to you, whether you like it or not. So this is all part of a process, which earlier NDA government had also done. They had thrown out a whole generation of textbooks in 1999, written by R.S. Sharma, Robila Thapar, Vipin Chandra, and Satish Chandra. They had thrown them out successfully. They had substituted books written by people who belonged to their line of thinking. Uh, Books were very substandard as well, had lots of errors. 
all this was pointed out by the Indian History Congress and other historians. So when the UPA government came to power, those books were then removed and a fresh lot of books, which are now being tampered with, were written in the period after 2004, roughly from, I would say, about 2005, 6, 7, 8, 9, because it takes time to write new books. So it was these books which were written by a very large number of people who came together. In fact, one of the uh, points that needs to be mentioned about the current books which are being uh, tampered with now, that uh, a very broad base committee was set up in each discipline, some 10 to 15 people. And each book for each class was also written by a group of scholars most of the time. So this whole thing about, you know, these books are all written by one clique of people, you know, leftists, Marxist, anti-nationals, whatever you like to call them, tukre tukre gang. And that's why we need to change them, which is the noise we are hearing all the time. Firstly, it doesn't even conform to the facts of the case. I have not heard in any of the TV debates or comments that I've heard that I've been hearing the last week or so, a single name of an author being mentioned, you know, because they don't know who they are. Even when they now mention authors, they mention authors of the books which were removed more than 20 years ago. Because there's a lot of shadow boxing going on here. Because those were important names, well-known names. You could attribute a particular way of thinking to them wrongly, but you could. So the whole debate is also going on with all these camouflages of various kinds. Of course, the NCRT director pleads total innocence and says that, oh, it is a committee of experts which has gone into it. And we've only done it to relieve the burden because of COVID, which the children are suffering from. I mean, you know, I mean, that's, <laughs> it's uh, uh, quite a... So fundamentally, two things are operating here. One is prejudice. And the second is a push towards a particular point of view which now conforms with the government in uh, place and more important, the larger ecosystem behind the government in place and Absolutely. all that. But I'm asking a simplistic question here, but I would like to know your views anyway. Why have textbooks become such a battlefield? Textbooks have not become now. Textbooks have been a battlefield. In Why India? so? Because the ecosystem, as you call them, you, you know, to put a name on it, you know, the RSS, Jansang, BJP way of thinking, they are very clear in one thing that you need to catch people young. I want to remind you that after independence, you know, you know that the RSS was banned and they were in jail for one and a half years. After they were, the ban was removed and they came back into the public life, one of the things, the first things they started was setting up of schools, not colleges, schools. What we now know as the Saraswati Shishu Mandirs. That's one name that most commonly used for them. And now there are thousands of such schools, somewhere at least in the range of 15 to 20,000, if not more. They started out with a few, but over the years, and when they have state power, they use that to expand themselves. The second thing, as you know, which is part of their core activity is the shakhas, the morning shakhas. Now, what happens in the morning shakhas? You catch, again, children who are very young. Your parents get attracted because there's physical, uh, you know, activity, exercise, etc. happening. So the children are lured, attracted because of that. And then you use the shakhas for your political, ideological propaganda. That's how the swayam sevak usually emerge. So they've been very clear that, and you know, one thing you have to recognize that this regime, this ecosystem is very ideological and they are committed to their ideology and they are very clear about their ideology. And there's been no change in that from the time the RSS was founded, the Hindu Mahasabha became an extremist organization under Savarkar. So from 1925, when the RSS was founded, and from the mid-30s, when Savarkar took over the Hindu Mahasabha, which earlier was a more moderate kind of organization, their ideological you know, project has been very clear. And whenever they get an opportunity, or even don't get an opportunity, they push that project. Right. Because they have a certain very clear-cut picture of the kind of India they want. It's not a futuristic India, as I love to say. They actually have no vision of the future. They only want to go back to the past. 
so going back to vedas or a pure kind of hindu land or whatever it might be you know now of course they add on development and all that in order to get votes but the core of the ideology is hindu rashtra and this hindu rashtra is defined in various kinds of ways where hindus are the dominant community and other communities with whom they are forced to live the other communities really ideally should get if they survive they should become second class citizens it's a very clear uh, picture and of course what is the position of women in it what should be the kind of education that should be there which should tell us about our ancient heroes which should make us forget about the mughal past except as oppressors and tormentors and people who converted forcibly and spoilt our women and you know that whole islamophobia thing yeah. so there is a very clear picture at the back of these exercises so exactly that was what it brings me in very neatly to what i was going to ask you know generations of students have grown up reading about the moguls as the same people do know that the rss was banned after gandhi ji's assassination there are newspaper headlines and so much more that spoke of that has gone and uh, now comes the news that all mention of molana azad have been taken out so how does this fit in with this vision that you spoke about because these are all uncomfortable facts which disturb that vision and therefore they should not remain in the public domain you see they don't care about people like you or others you know who may have an opportunity to read outside for exposed they are aiming for the common student who most likely will not pick up a book of history after school history only they will learn till class 10 anyway only the more specialized those who pick up history as a subject for 11 and 12 will even know a little more history at that point but basically they want that an average student an ordinary student belonging to the ordinary you know people of india should go through the school system without any exposure or awareness of this the real history of india you should go without knowing about indian diversity our linguistic diversity our caste diversity our religious diversity they should go through without knowing about caste oppression mind you they are very very conscious about excluding references to caste oppression you know there's discomfort because it disturbs the notion of an ideal hindu past if the ideal hindu past had untouchability as an essential element and inequality as an essential element it's not such a glorious past anything which questions the notion of a glorious hindu ancient past is taboo so similarly gandhi ji's assassination story it's a very powerful story after all perhaps after buddha as nehru said the tallest indian that we have produced the greatest indian that we are likely to produce in a long time fell to these communal forces any child in india who doesn't not very sophisticated but ordinary education if they get will ask a question is it there something to worry about the kind of political ideology which leads to the elimination of a man such as mahatma gandhi whom we still call father of the nation so these are uncomfortable facts which have to be somehow kept away in the hope that the child will ultimately never come across them or by the time the child comes he'll be ideologically so oriented that he will ignore or deny these facts not take them seriously the whatsapp university would have whitewashed his brain even more by then who and he will begin to believe that jawala nehru was a muslim born of a you know not a you know a mother who was you know it's <laughs> not real <laughs> and all that all the stories which are going around that people you know obviously people start believing them as well because they don't know better so to put a kind of spin on it uh, you have to show somehow that the moguls or you keep the parts which say that the moguls were actually very cruel to hindus etc etc you keep those parts but remove anything else which talks about the ne lai by akbar or that kind of thing yeah you even remove references to the fact that radha pratap was defeated i mean yes. you alter history to the extent that you can turn victory into defeat and defeat into victory you can declare a man called himu whom you know i might have read sometime in school but had very clearly forgotten as declare him as the last hindu emperor and then when i went and checked somewhere he was emperor for 15 days or something you know in between 
like he declared himself. I mean, you know, this is the kind of absurdity also that we come across. But one thing I want to point out before I forget, you see this Maulana Azad story, for example, which has only come out now. Yesterday, for the first time, the Hindu uh, reported that how they've even removed a reference which only mentions his name as one of the people who used to chair the committees in the Constituent Assembly. Even that much is not you know, permissible that a Muslim name can be mentioned as one of the five names that were mentioned as somebody who used to chair committees. I mean, that is the level of paranoia, you know, because somebody may then, uh, some curious student may say, so who was Molana Azad? He may actually look up who was and find out that this was, he was a very nice man. He doesn't fit into your picture of this cruel oppressor, that he was a very educated man. He was, you know, somebody whom even Nehru used to think was the fount of uh, knowledge and wisdom, you know. And you may find out a little bit more. But what is disturbing is that we actually don't know till now, Siddharth, what has been omitted. Because what the research by journalists is now showing us is the list which was put out last year of deletions, which were implemented this year, as Ritika Chopra of the Express showed to us, they're actually deletions much more than what is mentioned in the list. So it's also being done secretly. The NCRT director, when he was confronted with this, he said there may be some slips, as he said, of the tongue. I mean, he meant some slips, but there may be some slips here and there. If there was only one line removed, they may have forgotten to mention it. But obviously, frankly, we don't know unless we do a line by line comparison between the old books and the new books, which is going to take time. But we need to do it. We don't even know what all has been omitted. So we are only talking about the more obvious ones, which has been brought to our attention. We'll be right back after this short break. Welcome back to the Wire Talks. Now, has this been done by the NCERT director by Fiat or is there still those committees and I read somewhere that yes. one committee member said that we have no idea what was going on. How has it happened? What's the process? He refuses to, though he was asked to mention some name of the committee members, he refused to do so on television saying that professional ethics prevented him from doing so, as if being a member of a committee of NCRT was a state secret. I mean, why should an expert not want to be known as somebody who was on a committee, you know? So you, we actually don't know whether there were credible people on the committee, are the minutes of the committee, did they actually recommend? Who knows? These are all stories put out by the NCRT. And given the track record in how truthful they are being, they are claiming certain deletions and actually we are finding out that there were much more. I mean, who is one to believe? Uh, one of the complaints you talked about earlier, you talked about, oh, these leftist historians came up with history and it's time to uh, correct the balance, etc., etc. One of the grouses which has been aired a lot has been that there's too much emphasis on the Mughals, not enough emphasis on the Cholas, for example. And especially maybe not even a on other who happen to be Hindus. Now, if that is so, is this an attempt to redress that balance? Or is this a completely fake kind of shadow man that has been created? So, firstly, I would like to know how by deleting a chapter on the Mughals here and there, deleting passages on Mahatma Gandhi, removing... Malana Azad's name, removing the reference to the fact that Kashmir joined uh, India on the basis of, you know, a certain condition about autonomy and so many others. How does this redress the balance? How does it mean bringing in the Cholas? You are only making deletions. You are not adding anything. So that argument stands refuted on that ground only. Now we can come to the substance of the criticism, you know, which is, is it true? that these books or, you know, or these writers have been Mughal-centric and not talked enough about the others and this and that. Firstly, I believe it's not true, you know. 
neither in these textbooks nor otherwise the kind of history that we have been writing the generations before us the generation our generation the generations after that i think there's been a tremendous you know broadening of what constituted indian research in indian history and writing on indian history and there is enough material available on the cholas chalukyas pandavas and there has been the traditional histories also paid a lot of attention to south india to the great cholas and all that we all read about it in school in college in i remember in ancient india in my college you know and that is more than 50 years ago 55 years ago maybe now or more we read extensively about all these things and it is also not true that these books have been narrowly focusing on the in fact the way the syllabus is designed in the the ncert cbsc syllabus which supported by the ncert books in class 6 they begin at very simple level to read about ancient india so there's a whole year spent on ancient india in class 7 they do medieval period in class 8 they do modern india and the level of complexity goes on increasing as their age goes on increasing then in 9th and 10th earlier it was supposed to be world history today there is a slightly different uh, orientation of that but essentially history of other countries uh, other than uh, india and then at the so that by the time you finish your compulsory till class 10 the student has a fair idea of indian history as well as of important events that have happened in the world and mind you i also want to tell you that they've dropped a chapter on the industrial revolution from the course imagine one of the most important events what is it got to do with the uh, you know cholas or chalukyas or moguls nothing but such is the should i say the level of incompetence and sometimes of just thoughtlessness you want children to go through a course without knowing industrial revolution i mean it is so fundamental a change which still today the consequences of that we are you know we are a product of that all of us now and they dropped the full chapter on the industrial revolution so i would i think mean, you know there is so much of this kind of which ex- expert committee would do this i would really like to know that you drop <laughs> it's possible this is just conjecture <laughs> but it is possible that industrial revolution would be taken out by somewhere adding the notion that all these things had already been invented here in this yeah, land <laughs> that's right <laughs> Uh, <laughs> you're right but, that could be yeah i didn't think of it because yes you're right that may be that giving industrial revolution means giving credit to the west yes <laughs> yes I'm, i'm curious as have you yeah. heard of anything about the colonial uh, raj in this country being taken out no it's all there that's curious isn't it yes it is it is yes you know so that's why i said that the pattern of deletion is the giveaway it's the real giveaway you know but i never thought of the expedition for the industrial revolution thanks for pointing that out <laughs> no, i'm sure is... <laughs> i i am quite i'm quite sure that something like that uh, might well be because how do you then talk about uh, you know aeroplanes in ancient india and plastic surgery and all that if uh, you know Uh, it's actually with the industrial revolution that all these changes to modernity begin to happen and what again one of the criticisms and i just uh, heard some you know there are a lot of these pop up historians that are emerging from yeah uh, yeah yeah yes establishment and one of them said oh the moguls were outsiders they kept on trying to go back but uh, <laughs> the road was blocked or something like that <laughs> <laughs> but uh, one of the th- grouses has been that there's a lot of emphasis on certain nationalists mainly the associated with the congress and uh, because the indian national congress was a leading uh, organization and not enough on nationalist and this in quotes nationalist other nationalist heroes and we are going to try and insert those names of those nationalist heroes I don't know which names uh, these are but again I ask you as a historian as somebody who knows what is taught is this a generally legitimate uh, allegation No I don't believe so firstly let me tell you that these uh, new generation of textbooks that were written about uh, let's say now let's say about 10 years ago 10 to 12 years ago the ones we are talking about 
in these uh, generally the emphasis on political history is much less the sh focus shifted a lot to social history and uh, history cultural and other uh, aspects but even going to the specific point which you are raising i think number one obviously in any history of the freedom struggle the congress will occupy the primary place mahatma gandhi will have to be talked about as the foremost leader of the freedom struggle along with sadar patel and jawaharlal nehru and molana azad and sadar gopal achari and dada bhai naru ji and all these but it is not true that for example the contribution of the revolutionaries has not been talked about it is not true that subhash bose is not talked about these are all i would say wrong allegations and karnar meant to justify a certain point of view and to make people believe that it has been congress centric and gandhi centric or more even nehru centric i think i have been making this point repeatedly that when you make these allegations wild allegations you must quote chapter and verse and prove your points because the all the time this is said whereas it is not true you know we wrote a book a uh, five of us i think now 30 40 years ago which became quite well known called india struggle for independence bipin chandra was the lead author and uh, you know there were four of us others in it and if you just look at that book which came out i think in 1988 for the first time you know that as i said a good about 35 years ago we talked about peasant rebellions we talked about anti caste movements we talked about uh, the revolutionaries we talked about the left we talked about the socialists we talked about subhas chandra bose you know we talked about the up kisan sabha movement we talked about almost every possible you know story that could be there from dada bhai naru ji to the left to the right of course we also talked about uh what we call the communalist which they call nationalist they are very much there but they are there in what they actually did which is promote communalism there's muslim league there's jinnah there's everyone as examples of not the nationalist movement but those who followed a communal approach and who actually then led to the division of india you know so british policy is talked about the partition is talked about but so it's not it's just not true that even textbooks which maybe not ncert textbooks but other books which have been there in the market and which millions of students have by now studied that there has been this narrow approach to the writing of history you just have to look at the list of the chapters to see that what i'm saying is absolutely true you know among the many books you wrote there was one called rss textbooks and the murder of mahatma gandhi and did it predict all this did it kind of conjecture well it documented the first phase you see of the attempt to do away with the uh, the existing textbooks and put the others in its place so one part of that book actually came out of that concern with what was happening in the period 99 to 2004 we we started writing this soon after that and we documented the kind of entire history of uh, this interference and what kind of changes were made etc etc and then what we did was we did two things we had a whole section on the gandhi assassination the whole story of the assassination showing the links with the uh, you know the political wider political forces that were involved in this you know quoting and the thing is that the entire book is based on quoting primary sources letters of sadar patel quote from the jawaharlal nehru's letters to the chief ministers the inquiry committee report of uh, on the conspiracy to murder mahatma gandhi which was done by justice 65 to 70 this was done which then finally uh, made the link between you know savarkar and the conspiracy etc etc and then there was a section in it in which we talked about the basic foundational ideology of hindutva 
beginning with Savarkar, going on to Golwalkar and the speeches and resolutions of the Hindu Mahasabha, of the RSS, the writing, it showed the connection between these three, between the ideology, the murder, you know, the ideology at least was formulated, the murder and the what later the attempts to change the text. So basically this book was an attempt to show how dangerous the ideology is. It can lead to a heinous event like the murder of Mahatma Gandhi and it can also result in the messing with the future of our children. You know, so that's what it talked about. As I said, it's just coming true. Yeah. <laughs> so yes. your predictions, as it were, are all coming true because this is now at a much more intense level what's beginning to happen. You were talking about another India government, but this has been turbocharged in a sense and it's moving ahead full speed. Finally, you said that the, I read the statement of the Indian History Congress is pretty strong. They've called it alarming and they've said this is, you know, prejudiced and ignorant. And you said that the outcry this time is much more because this press has given it quite a lot of exposure. Outcry compared to the last three, four years, two, three years. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But there is an outcry. The media is taking note of it and it all adds up. Now, how do you think this is going to play out? in the sense that will all this where the insert director is clearly not being able to answer questions credibly how do you think this is going to play out are they going to backtrack or are they going to adjust or are they going to invite suggestions how do you think this is going ahead you know i doubt very much that they will respond to the criticism you know that's happening very widespread criticism that's happening and mind you uh, there's a lot of comment also in the international press on this, which has come quite rapidly, in fact, in the last few days. So the press in India and also civil society, you know, and historians, of course, are very concerned about this. But I somehow, uh, given the determination with which they are going ahead and in all other spheres where we see there is no give there's no genuine uh, you know desire to actually look at criticism and see if there's any value in it it's like there's a preordained thing which has been decided and you you know going ahead with it we've been seeing it in universities over the last uh, few years you know since 2016, for example, the vice chancellors who get appointed, you know, they just have an agenda and they go ahead with it regardless. You can go on criticizing, they can, I can jane you, you know, the administration lost some 200 cases which were filed by faculty and students against them. But it hasn't stopped them from doing exactly what they want to do. You know, they said, okay, fine, because I think the instructions are probably uh, very clear. And that's why I was pointing out that they're doing this not only in NCRT. The undergraduate syllabus is being messed with. The In UP, for example, they have already accepted the UGC syllabus, which, as was pointed out by the Indian History Congress earlier and in the parliamentary committees, there also, and the Indian History Congress uh, resolution, if you read the one which you mentioned just now, they pointed that out that how these attempts have been made successfully, where the Mughals have again been dropped. In fact, that syllabus, if you look at it, is so illiterate There's a that anybody would, should be ashamed to have their name associated with it. The UGC syllabus for undergraduate, uh, you know, history syllabus. I recall a syllabus for, I think it was on contemporary India, where more than half the books that were suggested had nothing to do with the subject. They had been picked up from anywhere and everywhere and just put over there. And all this has been pointed out in writing. But had any effect? No. I know that in UP, already the new syllabus has been implemented and publishers are bringing out uh, books with the altered syllabus. This has been happening since last year. See, most of the time, see that we don't even know what's happening and that's what's frightening. They are quietly burrowing their way everywhere and going on. It's only once in a while. Somebody takes it up and then for some reason it's caught on, you know, maybe because there's some change in atmosphere. There's a little more openness, you know, 
maybe opposition getting together or whatever it is rahul gandhi's yatra little more questioning a little more more people are willing to come out so even now people are very scared to speak up i have no hesitation in saying this on your i know my own colleagues who are very concerned about it but are hesitant to speak up for obvious reasons because the kind of attacks that academia has been facing you know in my university jnu where i spent more than 40 years people's pensions have been stopped their leave has been denied you know they are harassed and hounded so what do you expect people have to live their everyday lives you know so not everyone is going to come out and take big risks of being punished and penalized A, a colleague of ours who retired two years ago, you know, he died without getting his pension. You know? I mean, these are the kind of things that people have been facing. So they had to go to is, court to even get your pension. This is a depressing thought that nobody is speaking up, but it's now very few, I would say. But I'm just thinking how depressing it's going to be that generations of students, probably in UP undergraduate level, maybe high school, maybe lower school. will grow up not knowing as you said about the industrial revolution not knowing about mahatma gandhi's assassination and the aftermath not knowing about uh, so many things and not knowing that there was someone like the moguls who had done a lot of you know good things in this country also and it's wrong to say they were outsiders they became indians uh it's so generations are going to grow up and perhaps somebody is going to uh, some student is at some stage going to see moglias I and mean, say who are these people where did this story come from you must have seen those you know all the jokes that are now there with yes. uh, salim telling uh, anarkali anarkali utho ab ab hum log tum aur main ab syllabus mein nahi hai chalo chalte <laughs> <laughs> so even all those jokes will have no meaning to somebody yeah. without a rep point so it is a depressing thought one can hope that they they get reversed they did get reversed in uh, dr manmohan singh's government took over they did get reversed yeah. but one can only hope but otherwise to imagine i mean you and i and so many others have passed that stage but somebody entering a child entering the stream the social cbsc stream today is going to be subject to this kind of cooling uh, and it has well, a multiplier effect you see it has yes, a multiplier effect because the ncert books are also telling you the cbsc syllabus and ncert you know they go in tandem they also tell you the syllabus for the competitive exams like the suet which has newly been instituted so it will be out of that also and yeah. all the well, state boards follow the ncert book you know so unless well, the state take a conscious decision that we will not follow the ncert book it's automatically they this gets translated down the line yeah and civil services also graduates will perhaps have heard right. this yeah so worrying thought but thank you professor for explaining it in such detailed context that we now understand in fact i was just thinking that this thing about up needs a little bit more highlighting but we'll talk about that some stage that was professor mridula mukherjee is veteran and well known historian who taught in jnu and several other centers all around the world speaking to us about the recent changes in the history and political science syllabus syllabi of high schools and undergraduate teaching next week we'll be back with another guest till then from me sadat bhatia and the rest of the wire talks team goodbye you can check out this podcast and other interesting ones on the wire website the ivm podcast website app or wherever else that you get your podcasts goodbye from me sadat bhatia and the wire talks podcast team